Gene asked me if I would share today on five ways to guard your emotional well-being in ministry. Some of you may be familiar with a gentleman by the name of Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi was a coach, NFL coach. He coached for the Green Bay Packers. But it was said of Vince Lombardi that when he would have spring training um, and, and the team would gather together, they would come in and he would hold up something. Anybody know what it was? It was a football. And he would say, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would start with the foundational basics and he led his team to five NFL championships in nine years. And those foundational basics are sometimes things that are easy to drift from. And I wanna share with you these five different aspects, these five different ways of guarding your emotional well-being to help you stay on track. Number one, guarding your well-being through honesty, through honesty. It's a simple concept, just be honest. It's really helpful for those of us who our memories are going a little bit because if you're not honest, you have to remember what you told someone before. But honesty is important. And, and yet the father of lies and his cohorts would try to get us off track as it relates to honesty. I wanna share with you just a brief segment of Genesis chapter three, verse six. Goes back to the garden. Honesty or dishonesty at that point started very early on. And so the first area of honesty is honesty with yourself. Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. There are three things that we know were going on in the mind of Eve. Now, it had to be supernatural because the author of Genesis, Moses, wasn't there. But there are three things that she was aware of. One was that it was good for food. Secondly, that it was visually appealing. Now, my wife has helped me out a bit as it relates to food being visually appealing. When I make a salad, I put in lettuce, green beans, and green peppers sliced up, okay? So she's helped me. She's got a little bit more color in there. We get uh, some tomatoes. We get some yellow peppers. We get some red peppers, some carrots. So we get some color that are present but visually appealing apparently to Eve. The third thing was that it would make one wise. Now, you need to keep in mind that the serpent, Satan, spoke to Adam and Eve. And what was his lie? That if you eat of this tree, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will become wise as God. We're told three things that she was thinking about. What was missing? What God had told them. Don't eat of this tree. And so she kind of filtered that out in her process of thinking and she made a decision based upon that. It was the biggest mistake that has ever taken place in this world. And so we need to be honest with ourselves and it's so easy to be tempted to not look at the whole truth, not to look at what God says to us. I'm reminded of a few rationalizations that I've heard in my life. One of them was a young woman who was speaking to her sister and her sister was pregnant, but her sister was not married. And so this person who was speaking with me just shared that uh, she was talking with her, and I think gently was just kind of challenging her sister. And her sister's comment was this. She said, yeah, well, I'm pregnant, but so was Mary. Okay, and she's not talking about Mary, her neighbor. She's talking about Virgin Mary. 
the rationalizations that are easy to do. There was one gentleman who decided to go on a spiritual fast. So he made a decision. I, I'm, I'm not going to eat at McDonald's. I don't know if it was during Lent or whatever, but he decided he wasn't going to eat at McDonald's. So as he was in the car with this other individual, he said, hey, hey, can you pull into to that store there? I want to get something at Wendy's. Not really what we would say is wise when you're trying to fast for McDonald's. I mean, Wendy's would probably be a close second. And yet, I think when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, our rationalizations are like the, you know, so was Mary, or pull into Wendy's. God knows our rationalization, how tempting it can be to take what we want and make that what we're saying God says. But it's also important to realize what we need to be honest about. We need to be honest about our brokenness, our brokenness. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus says, if you then, and he was talking to his disciples, a group of other people who were kind of interested in what he had to share. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And I can kind of imagine what it might have been like at that time where you had these group of people and they're hearing about Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit can be given, but there are three words that I'm not sure they were anticipating. After Jesus said you, he said, who are evil. And I could just imagine some of them kind of looking around like, is he talking about you? He's not talking about me. I mean, me, evil, no. No. And yet Jesus doesn't say it in a condemning way. He doesn't say it in a way of putting them down. He's just honest about the fact that we are broken people who need the grace of Jesus Christ. I think back in my childhood, I didn't have a, you know, into drug abuse and came to Christ. Actually, I was raised in a Christian home But I think back to my brokenness as a child, and I was just kind of thinking back about this recently as I was preparing for this. And I remember, I think it was second grade, it was Sunday school class, and I brought a, I brought a pocket knife with me. Now I didn't use it on anyone, but I think I showed it to someone and one of the individuals in the choir kind of kindly took me to one of my parents uh, because I had that. But I remember a time when I was in high school and probably one of the most profound moments of my brokenness, there have been others too, but this one really struck me. I was in a high school musical my senior year and we were deciding how to uh, prepare to do the curtain call at the end. And I remember there were two things that I wanted. One of them was, I wanted my own curtain call. I wanted to come out by myself. The other was, I wanted a crescendo. That's pretty bad. That's my brokenness. Now I can look back and say, well, that's gone. That was how many years ago, 40 years ago or whatever. But my brokenness is still there. Every once in a while when I'm caught in a traffic jam, I have this thought that maybe just up ahead, there's a, there's a fender bender. And if there is, then, I mean, I don't want anybody getting killed, but if there's a fender bender, then we'll get through this a whole lot quicker. I'm thinking about me at that moment. I have no thought about anyone else. Would I want them to hope that I was in the fender bender? No, but I was thinking about me. Now, before you write me off, how many of you football fans have a deep sense of sorrow and remorse when the opposing quarterback has to limp off the field, okay? Probably not too many of us, you know. There's brokenness in each one of us, and it's acknowledging what goes on in our lives and how we need to bring it before the Lord. I think of a quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, hell is for those who think they're good. It's for those who know they're not. And again, it's not about condemnation. It's not about, oh, I have to feel so terrible about me. It's simply acknowledging the truth that I'm a broken man or I'm a broken woman and I need Jesus Christ. One of our campuses at our church 
is a correctional facility, a prison. And so periodically I'm down with the men. I'll tell you one thing I have never seen so much. When I go down and the guys come in, there is a smile on their face. There is an excitement to see part of the church body from Colorado Springs there. I mean, they, everyone wants to shake my hand, you know, and not just me, it's the other volunteers that are coming down as well. But there's an excitement there. But when they sing the song, my chains fell off, I've been set free. These are men who are excited. These are men who feel the truth of that. Even though there's a wall behind them, there's wire, they can't get out. But spiritually, God has done a work in their heart and in their life. When we forget what our need is, our well-being is in grave danger. Honesty with yourself. Secondly, honesty with God. So what happened when Adam and Eve ate? It says they went and they hid. They weren't coming for God. They weren't saying, hey God, here's what we did. No, they went and they hid. But God came looking for them. God came and pursued them. And so we find in Genesis 3.11, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? As if God didn't know, right? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, yes, yes, I did. No, that wasn't his response. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. There wasn't an honesty with God. There was, a, there was a denial, there was a blame. Not only blaming her, but he's blaming God too. I mean, you gave her to me, so it's not my, not my bad, not my fault. But that honesty with God about what we are, who we are, what we struggle with. As if we can hide anything from God. <laughs> It's kind of, it reminds me of the, the child who's playing hide and seek and, you know, they're getting close to, you know, the number that comes up and now the person's going to come seek them. You know, and they close their eyes and they cover their face and they think they won't be seen. I mean, obviously that's not the case. And yet we tend to do the same thing with God. At the time when we need to be the most honest, at the time where we may be tempted or struggling the most, we need God's presence the most is when we tend to become quiet in our talk with him. I think of Psalm, uh, the Psalms, David and other Psalmists. In some of their most deep struggling times is when they're the most honest with God. And that's what God wants in our lives. And thirdly, honest with others. Oh, I can't share that. Well, why not? Well, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a youth leader. I'm a church administrator. I, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. I think there are four reasons why people tend not to be honest with others. One is fear of rejection. If I tell you this, you will reject me. And I, I can't have that. I need your acceptance. I need your approval. I, I need to have you not reject me. And there's a second that's a close tie to it. And that is our fear of embarrassment. Our fear of embarrassment. If there's a struggle that we're going through, we don't want to look bad. We don't want to be embarrassed. So we tend to, we tend to keep it in. Thirdly, I think, is a fear of accountability. A fear of accountability. If I tell you what I'm struggling with, if I tell you what's going on in my heart, there's a good chance that if you're concerned about me, at some point shortly down the road, you're going to ask me, hey, how are you doing? And I don't want to be accountable because then I probably have to deal with this. So it's easy not to share it but to simply keep it hidden. And the fourth reason is we're not interested in the consequences. 
Sometimes there can be consequences to sharing what's going on in our lives. But generally speaking, when there are consequences, they may be consequences we need to face. If somebody is telling someone of a, a sexual inappropriateness, have you spoken to your wife? Have you spoken to your husband? Well, no. Okay, that probably needs to happen. And so the importance of being willing to face those consequences that are present in life. It was John Ortberg, a pastor at a church in Menlo, uh, at Menlo Church in California. I remember hearing him talk about a time where he, I don't know if it was a counselor, I don't know if it was a pastor or mentor, I think it was a mentor, but where he wrote down everything he could remember about his life. The pretty, the ugly, the in-between, he wrote it all out and he took time. I don't know how long it took him to share it, but it was double digits of pages that he wrote and he shared it with this person. And at the end of what he had shared, the person still accepted, still loved him. I think we have this idea that if I share what's going on in my life, you won't accept me. You won't love me anymore. And I think that's from the pit of hell. There's a French novelist, Andre Malraux, who said, man is not what he thinks he is, he is what he hides. And it's real easy to hide a lot in our lives. I wanna take you back just a little bit, give you a little bit of background in my life. I grew up in a Christian home, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. I grew up in a house that had been a barn. So 20, actually about 40 years before I was born, the house had burned down on the front lawn. So whoever owned the house at that time, it wasn't my parents, but they turned the barn into a house. So there was no level floor in the house. Uh, the kitchen table would kind of go like this. And if any of you know the game Stratomatic Football, a table that goes like this is real helpful to the person who's on this side of the table. Okay, not the person who's on this side of the table. That was probably my brokenness even early before my high school years. But it was a, it was a big house. My parents had um, five children, adopted a, a, a young girl from Korea when I was about 10 or so. My dad was a nurseryman and a landscaper. He was a pretty quiet man but he was a man of faith. He loved the Lord, he loved my mom, and showed kindness to her in, in many ways. My mom was an individual, probably one of the most unique individuals I can ever recall. Um, I cannot remember a day where I would come down to the kitchen table and my mom would not have her Bible, her commentaries, uh, that she was also, before or after she did her personal study, she was listening to Robert A. Cook from the King's College, Derek Prince, Focus on the Family, uh, Charles Stanley, uh, different preachers. She loved the Lord. And my parents not only had this love for the Lord, but they lived out their life for the Lord. Not only did they adopt my sister from Korea, but there were also foster siblings over a course of probably about, I don't know, 20 years or so, there were maybe 30 foster children, different periods of time. Some might be for a weekend, some would be for a longer period of time. I think the longest was about five years, Mike Hoy, who is uh, a foster brother. We had refugee families from Afghanistan, from Laos, from Romania, that came and lived at our parents' house. There would be times I wouldn't know if my bed was gonna be clear because there may have been somebody who came that needed a bed to stay and my parents opened up their house to the person. So there was a deep joy about the Lord. I would say in some ways it was kind of like a, a very ecumenical evangelical family. My parents were Lutheran, but there were people from Baptist, Assembly of God, Evangelical Free, all kinds of people that we interacted with over the years. And when I was about 10 years of age, I remember going forward at a Tom Skinner crusade and trusted in Christ. Now I may have been a believer before that, but I know from that time forward, I had trusted in Christ. When I was about 13 or 14, I believe that God had called me to ministry 
And so I was pursuing that. I went to a Christian college. I majored in history. And I was going to take one year off. I was going to work. And then I was going to go to seminary. So that was my plan. During that year, I went through probably the most horrific year of my entire life. Because I started struggling with faith. I was saying to myself, you know, I believe that there's a God, but there's a part of me that's just struggling with it. And I remember three particular conversations that I had that were extremely meaningful to me. One was a conversation with my parents. Now, my parents couldn't identify with what I was sharing, but they accepted me in the midst of my struggle. Then I had a conversation with my older brother. My older brother was a pastor. And he shared a couple of words with me that at the moment were probably not the most enjoyable words to hear. But he said, keep thinking. Part of me didn't want to hear that because if I could have tuned my mind out, I would have done it. And the third conversation was with my brother Gary. My brother Gary is two years older than me. He and I, probably for the last 20 years or so, have every other Sunday, we call each other, we share prayer requests, we pray with each other. But that particular day, I was working at this woodworking shop. My brother actually is retiring from a woodworking shop this year, so he has the great woodworking ability. I was kind of the chief sander, but his ability was there. And I remember that particular day, I, was, I went to the bathroom, I just started crying. And then on the way home, I just couldn't hold it anymore. And I started crying again. And my brother said to me, he said, Glenn, what, what's going on? I said, Gary, more than anything else in the world, I want to believe, but I just can't. And I will remember till my dying day what he said to me. He said, Glenn, I don't think of you as any less of a person or a Christian just because you're going through this. Now, he and I talked a bit after that about things of the faith. To be honest with you, I don't remember anything we said in that part of the conversation. But his acceptance saying, I don't think of you as any less of a person or a Christian just because you're going through this has been something that I I hold on to. In fact, I was sharing with him the other day that I was going to be sharing this at uh, this meeting and I also had a tough time just keeping tears from my eyes because of how powerful it was. It took about a year working through that struggle I wanted God to write across the sky. And I realized that as a believer in Jesus Christ, I believe some pretty amazing, some would say far-fetched things. I believe that a baby was born without a human father. I believe that there were walls of water that stood straight up so that the children of Israel could go through them. I believe that people were raised from the dead by the power of God. Those are pretty amazing things. But you know what? (laughs) Every day you and I have to wake up to an even larger miracle. That you and I are here and that this world is here. And the complexity of what God has created. If you can explain that away, good luck. Apart from God. C.S. Lewis has been pretty influential in my life, probably to many of you as well, just the profound thinking of the gentleman. And there's a screensaver I have on this laptop. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Nothing makes any sense apart from the power of a God who has created How do you make sense of love? How do you make sense of forgiveness? How do you make sense of morality apart from a God who has communicated himself to us? There's a particular story in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. The Silver Chair is probably my favorite of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia books. And there's a scene where Jill is looking for water and there's this lion who kind of comes in between the stream and her, and she asks Aslan to move away. (laughs) He says, no, I'm not going to. Well, will you, you know, will you, will you, will you harm me? Are you safe? You know, will you promise to do nothing? He says, no, I make no promise. 
And Jill, he, she, Jill finally says, well, then what I'll do is I'll go and I'll look for other water. <laughs> and Aslan says, there is no other water. This is the only water that will satisfy you. So she got up some courage and went and drank and had the most satisfying water that there was. Apart from God, you and I do not experience the most satisfying water that there ever was. And there were two verses that were extremely helpful for me. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. The apostle Paul says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we're gonna see face to face. Here he is, one of the most profound, influential believers in Jesus Christ in all of history, saying, we see in a mirror right now dimly, but there will be a time that you and I will see face to face. Mark 9, 24. This was a story of Jesus healing the uh, father's son who threw himself into the fire. The man says, Lord, if you can, Jesus says, if I can, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man said this, he said, immediately the father of the boy cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Boy, that was meaningful for me because I thought, you know, it's either I have to be all belief, never any doubts or just doubts. But what struck me was the majority of time in my life, belief is there and it dwarfs the unbelief. So there may be times that we struggle. In fact, I would say, I wish that, that I could mention that, you know, after that period of time in my early 20s, that was it. That's the last of the doubt. But I remember about 10 years ago, I was struggling. I kind of think of it as 10 days from hell, literally. And I shared it with my bride, Elizabeth, and she shared three words with me that totally nixed the doubt. Three words. Well, one of them was my name, so that leaves two for impact. Okay. She said, Glenn, you're obsessing. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that is exactly what's going on. I gotta believe, I gotta believe, I gotta believe. I can't doubt, I can't doubt, I gotta believe. If I were to say to you, don't think about a white rabbit, what would you think about? The white rabbit, the thing you're trying not to. When we just say, God, this is in your hands. You care about me more than I care about myself. You have the power to hold me. You will hold me by your grace. And I can rel relax and rest and I can believe because he's the only thing worth believing in. Every one of us in this room has probably someone that we need to share and be honest with. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's not doubts for you, but whatever it may be, maybe it's somebody you need to make a confession to. Maybe it's somebody who, maybe you've brushed off and you need to hear their heart, but going to them and being able to be honest with them, whatever it is, be open to it.